Uh, welcome to the afternoon session here. Uh, I'm in fact not the moderator, but as I'm standing here, I will say hello. Uh, moderator is this gentleman over here. Uh, my name is Roland. In between uh, helping organise Foss Asia in the last six weeks, I've been working on building a satellite rotator or satellite tracker. And my talk today is uh, why this is interesting, and then actually only a little bit at the end about the device itself. So uh, this, sort of, this all begs the question: How? What is it that an individual could do to talk to a satellite if you're not a telco? If you're a telco, you've got dishes and so forth. Almost since the beginning of radio, there's been a, a hobby, if you like, and a licensing arrangement for amateurs to use radio spectrum uh, by themselves rather than in the context of a broadcast or a mobile network. This service, astonishingly, is still existing even here in Singapore. There are currently fewer than 100 licensees, but it has never died out completely. To understand where it sits, there are a few ways to lawfully transmit radio signals. The most common is what are called industrial scientific and medical devices. The example we're all familiar with is Wi-Fi, but Bluetooth and garage door controllers and wireless microphones and all, almost every other thing that you've got that transmits a, a signal and is not connected to a mobile network is an ISM band device. The difficulty with ISM band devices is the power limits are extremely low. Whereas for some things you want to do, like talk to satellites, you need more than the amount of power that's permissible for ISM. Um, for the licensed transmitters, so this doesn't need a license, you can just go and buy a Wi-Fi device and use it. For license holders, uh, really there are four groups. Broadcasters, TV, radio, uh, mobile network operators, the telcos, maritime aeronautical and land mobile. So there's a whole lot of people who, like security guards, who walk around with radios, not unlike this one, walkie-talkies effectively. They have a distinct license to use that set of radios in that area for that application. And then finally, amateurs. So the amateur service looks a bit like the land mobile service, except that amateurs are required to pass a theory exam on electronics and radio as part of the licensing because we get to make our own decisions about, to some extent, about what we transmit and how we transmit it. There are rules, and you've got to pass an exam on those rules, which means you have to know what the rules mean, which means you need to know the theory. Um, whoops, I'm showing my... Yes. Um, so there's kind of a question about why bother with amateur radio anymore. So back when there was you know, broadcast radio in 1905 and amateur radio in 1915, there was a whole vista of unexplored territory that amateurs got involved in. But bit by bit, communications has gotten easier for everybody. So the internet in 69, cellular mobile in 79, mobile internet in 96, and then ubiquitous smartphones and broadband in the last decade, depending on which year you count. And so people ask sort of why bother? Before I get to that, I'll talk about evidence that there is a change. About half the world's amateur licensees are in the US. This is the number of licenses issued year by year in the last decade. Something's happened in the last six years. No one is quite sure what, but we think it's the maker movement. So over time, everyone getting hypnotized with their smartphones became less and less and less and less interested in using amateur radio to communicate long distance. But quite suddenly, in 2008, something changed. And the guess is it's the maker movement. If you look at the definition of amateur radio and you take out that third point, sorry, the second point about intercommunication, this almost defines the maker movement. This is the language that's been used to define amateur radio for more, for more than half a century. And I, I would suggest that the alignment between people who were amateurs for the last, most of the last century and people who are now makers is very, very close. So again, that doesn't answer the question, you know, why bother? So there's some things that mobile phones can't do. Uh, if you're in a place where the mobile network isn't, then your mobile is completely useless. I mean, it's a smartphone, it can play a local game or something, but it can't do any communication. So if you're in wilderness areas, if you're communicating in space, uh, if you're bouncing stuff off the moon, which I'm aiming to do maybe this year, maybe next, this is stuff you just can't do with mobile phones. Um, oh, sorry, there's two different points. Where it doesn't exist or when it's down. So in both Haiti and Tibet in the last four months, there have been natural disasters which took out phone networks. At that point, emergency responders couldn't move around except to the extent that they had their own radios. So amateurs got involved and began providing communications while uh, commercial networks were rebuilt. But amateurs can set up in hours, commercial networks take weeks to rebuild. Uh, DOI electronics, if you're making your own radios, 
then you, the only way to get those on air is to use it is with an ample license. So if you're, if the electronics itself is of interest. And finally, although I don't do it, high power operation. So it's fairly common around the world to use amateur radio to communicate via the ionosphere directly. So in theory, someone can, an amateur can communicate from here to someone in, say, New York without infrastructure, just using the Earth's ionosphere as a communication duct, despite the fact that it's on the opposite side of the planet. That requires a lot of power. In fact, amateurs do a whole lot of stuff. Um, public service and competition aren't a big deal here. Long distance is common. Uh, repeaters, satellite, my interest, which is a basically a repeater that happens to be in orbit. Uh, moon bounds, which I'm working towards. Uh, tracking high altitude balloons. If you release a high altitude balloon to take photographs of the edge of space, how are you going to work out where your balloon landed to get your camera back? If you're in an area with good mobile coverage but no expensive buildings, like desert areas in Australia or the US, that's fine. Sometime, as your camera comes plummeting to Earth, it'll be in mobile range for about 30 seconds. That's just long enough to get one message to tell you where your device is. But if that fails, or if it comes down in an area where you don't have mobile coverage, then you will not find your balloon, or you won't, you won't find your camera. So there are people who do uh, putting cameras on the edge of space who depend upon amateurs or who are amateurs to track their balloons. So they're putting a transmitter on board the balloon that's more powerful than an ISM band transmitter and then using a, a, its amateur band and tracking the balloon as it goes up and comes down so they can find the, the camera and recover it after it lands. Some really extraordinary people wait for meteors to enter the ionosphere. As a meteor passes through the ionosphere, it leaves behind a trail of ionized gas which will reflect radio waves. It's only there for about 15 seconds, but that's just enough time for really determined people to bounce signals off it and have a very short conversation. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making this up. This is perfectly real. I'm not yet at the point where I'm willing to try that, but there are people doing it. Uh, less ambitious, there are guys in Sydney and Melbourne who actually use jumbos. They know where the 747s are. They're, they are on predictable flight schedules. And a plane is a much slower moving and much larger object than a meteor trail. And so they just bounce signals off uh, aircraft is large. It's fine. By the time the signal hits the plane, it's way below the noise threshold. There's not much power left. The guys receiving have a hard time picking up the signal, but they know where the plane is. So it's, it's doable. Uh, direction finding, fox hunting is a sort of field game for playing. We might do a maker fair this year. We'll see. Uh, and mountain topping, if you happen to like walking in mountains, it's actually fun to operate when you've got a huge amount of visibility. But my talk is nominally about satellite. Uh, this introduces a whole lot of complexity. The first thing is, uh, where is the satellites? Or where are the satellites? It happens that there are, oops, wrong screen. Like this. Right, this is live. There are about half a dozen, or eight, I think, satellites capable of carrying amateur traffic. Um, one of them, whose name I can't read on that, will actually come into signal range for us in 1346. Six minutes. So that the circle we can see with its lower edge near Singapore is a satellite that's going northwest. That way. So it'll rise there in about six minutes. It'll cross the sky in about 10 or 12. Are those all satellites? Do you know what about them? All the, these are, what do you know about them? Uh, these are the only, these are the satellites that are currently in service and carrying amateur traffic. All? I believe so, yes. It's eight, this, there might be a couple more. Um, I thought there were about 12 or 15. This only knows about eight. Oh, okay. uh, so, yeah, can't, I can't explain that. There are, I suspect, a few more. The number isn't huge, but it's enough to play with. And it gives what it, Australia's covered, I assume that might be geostationary, right? No, no. Every one of these is low Earth. There's, oh, there's, at the present moment, there are no geostationary amateur transponders. There will be next year, and you will not believe which country's radio club is doing it. Okay. Qatar. What? <laughs> QTEL is putting a new, a new phone, a TV and phone uh, geostationary satellite up next year, and apparently the, the Qatar Amateur Radio Club has managed to get itself space on that satellite. Space and power. Wow. So in theory, in about nine months, ten months' time, it will be possible for amateurs to, over most of Asia, including Singapore, to communicate via a repeater that's 36,000 kilometers up and apparently stationary. Watch this space. <laughs> that's, that's actually fairly exciting, and it's quite difficult. The, the, Signal, while it's not moving, which are half the problems I'm about to talk about don't apply, uh, 70 or 36,000 kilometers each way is just a long, long way. And you're, you're the, 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 the signal attenuation that occurs over that 
range is, is significant. Um, for satellites that are moving, however, which all of these are, uh, there's a whole range of problems. The first one, hello, oh, hang on, switch back. Bit. Right. So the first one is where they are. So, okay, you've got prediction software that knows how, where they are and how they're moving, and can therefore tell you when a thing is about to rise over your horizon and where it'll set. Um, the next problem is that amateur satellites are, to put it politely, a bit cheap, up until QTELs. But generally, they're a thing the size of a shoebox that's just tumbling in space. They don't bother with attitude control, because that requires fuel and extra mass and extra power. So, if you've got a pair of antennas talking, they need to be roughly parallel. If you turn them 190 degrees, you've got almost no communication. So if you've got a satellite that's tumbling at random in three dimensions, then you have a problem. The solution to that problem, the reason my antenna has a, has a nice soft foam handle, is not only do you point your antenna at the satellite, you twist it to match so that your antenna matches the orientation of the satellite's one. And it will change continuously, very slowly, but it will change continuously. Um, so yeah, freehanding is the simple way to do it. The other thing you can do is take advantage of the fact that right angle um, signals are, don't interfere with each other. So instead, use two. This is not something you can do by, with a free hand if you've got a dual band antenna, but if you notice the steel box there and the steel box there, you might perhaps guess that they are similar. In fact, it's the same device. I haven't yet done the two antenna boom. This is the device I'm building, and what I intend to get to is this position, where it has two antennas at right angles, <coughs> which means that the orientation problem no longer applies. As long as the thing is pointing in the right direction, mm -hmm. it will get enough signal between the two antennas to operate, except for the one case where the antenna is oriented that way. At which point, but that's, you know, okay, one over in a hundred, you won't be able to talk. Um, that's the easier problem. <laughs> the next one is something called Doppler. This is the, you know, a train's pitch changes as it comes towards you and goes away from you. The effective ground speed of a low Earth, low Earth orbit satellite is about 20,000 kilometers an hour. Horizon to horizon in 15 minutes. And so that's fast enough that even for radio, speed of light communication, there's a measurable do Doppler impact of several percent. And that means that you've got to adjust the frequency of your both your transmitting and receiving radios to compensate for Doppler. The next problem is something called hidden transmitter. Let us suppose that B is the satellite. I'm here at position A in Singapore, and someone else is in C, let's say, Tokyo. The whole point of wanting to talk through a satellite is that we can't see each other directly with this particular band. So there might be other people using it that I can't hear. So the deal here is that when you're doing satellite, because of all the other problems, orientation, uh, attitude, and Doppler shift, you don't transmit and then listen. You listen continuously, and then when there's a, a gap, you then transmit, but you continue listening. So you're transmitting and receiving at the same time. So that requires two things. One is a radio capable full duplex operation. There are six model of the 100 models of amateur radio in wide use in the world today. There are about six that can do it, none that are legal in Singapore. Fine. So fine, I'll just use two radios. It's perfectly fine. You, you listen with one, you transmit with the other. The problem is, it's a feedback risk. If you have like a PA system where the microphone gets too close to the speaker, you get this howling sound. Well, the same is true for radio. And so the solution to that problem is for the transmitting or the uplink frequency and the downlink frequency to be not merely two different frequencies, but on two different bands, because the satellite can't afford the weight to carry good filters for frequencies that are close together. So put them so far apart that they don't interfere with each other at all. That's why the satellite has meter-long elements in one direction, and 35 centimeter long elements in the other direction. The two separate bands, one's used to transmit, one's used to receive, and they're right angles to each other to make it even less likely that they won't interfere. Um, right. That's the list of problems. And so you know, why build a tracking device? So the conventional amateur radio operation is listening and talking and making entries in a logbook. Mine's in here somewhere. To do what I've just described with a satellite without a tracker, you have to point the antenna at the satellite, forward across the sky, rotate the antenna to match the orientation antenna, perform Doppler correction by hand, and speak and listen, and make entries in the logbook. I don't have that many hands. And so, you know, make life a bit easier, use a device like this, which has a, a two-axis mount, so it will both tilt and rotate. 
So it's capable of tracking a device like somewhere across the sky. Use the two antennas to solve the orientation problem, then we don't care about the orientation of the satellite. There's a small loss in signal for doing that, but it's easier than trying to rotate the, the antenna. Um, and although I can't do it yet, have a piece of computer software perform Doppler correction uh, on your radio's frequency. You, the computer won't transmit, but it will tell the radio what frequency to operate. And so second by second, make little changes. And they're predictable. We know where the satellite is, therefore we know exactly what correction to apply. So once all that stuff has been offloaded onto a computer and, and the mechanism to do it, it's back to listen and talk and maintain interest in the logbook, which is what amateurs have been doing for decades. So I've got a couple, I'm looking at two designs. I started with uh, sort of an old faithful by a guy named Mark Spencer, uh, which I now regret. <laughs> Firstly, it's a recipe rather than a complete design. Secondly, um, the control is a bit antiquated. So reprogramming requires downloading a new tool chain and a whole lot of other stuff. Thirdly, it's by metal robotic parts and machine. Uh, it's been a while since I was in high school. My metalworking skills have declined. Uh, so it's, if you look at it closely, it's a bit rough. Um, the other thing is it's all US parts. It's US robotics parts. And they're all imperial measures. So I'm sitting in hackerspace. I'm like, oh, I need a screw which does this. Nope. <laughs> Everything we have, even in hackerspace, is in metric. So there are no loose parts available for... Uh, for solving problems. And finally, it's not weatherproof. It's really only intended for tripod mounting for portable use. The one that I rather wish I had picked up is a thing called Satnogs. It's a much more modern design. It's 3D printable, it's parametric. You can take the designs and scale them up or down if you wish. It's not just a fixed design. Uh, they use a BeagleBone to control it, which means the software is actually accessible and easy to modify and complete. But importantly, they're running a global tracking network. So they currently run about half a dozen ground stations, I'll add one if I can find a site in Singapore, it's a bit tricky, um, which then allows satellites that don't have lack of coverage to be tracked wherever they are, subject to other demands on the network. But yeah, it's this sort of aluminium and nice gears printer and ABS printer and tracking software. It's a much more contemporary approach to the problem, not as tried and true as this one, but no need to work steel. <laughs> so I wish I had done this one first. Um, Happy to take questions. What I will attempt, depending upon what uh, GPredict tells us, I've now lost my prediction software. <coughs> After the talk, uh, right, that one is too marginal. I'll look at it afterwards. Uh, sometime this afternoon, I will go outside and actually do a demonstration of at least the receive side. I have two radios, but I'm not yet set up to transmit properly. Not using the tracker, just freehanding. Now, those who are looking backwards when the photo is being taken might have seen me playing. And it is all working. Uh, that's all I want to talk about at this point. Uh, did this make any sense? Uh, does anyone have questions? Stunned silence. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, that, all analog, not digital. Your actual transmission is what you actually transmit. Um, so right now it's just voice, yes. Um, Are there any rules or anything against digital? Like, uh, that's a bit of a landmine, uh, but a bit of a minefield. Uh, broadly, it's okay. Um, IDA's rules are a little outdated, and so there's a bit of give and take there. Okay. Nothing. Because you're saying you have to listen and wait for a gap and receive. Wouldn't it just make sense that this is all automated? I, the basic mission computer software, listening for gaps, sending, receiving. Once you like get beyond a certain degree of, of precision, yes. Getting to that point is quite difficult because uh, you've got to have quite precise placement of your equipment. You've got to know which way north is. Yeah. So you get. I mean, once you get to a certain degree precision, yes. And there are packet modes. The more common one is Morse. Uh, but there are, there are also some custom modes that are digital but not um, uh, not automatic communication systems. So things like uh, what's called JT65, which I tend to use for the moon bounce, encodes each set of six bits. Well, there's a whole lot of encoding, but you end up with groups of six bits being sent as one of 64 turns. You, mean you can hear it if you listen to it. Um, it's a mode that you can't decode by listening to it. But it's also a mode that you, a computer is listening to a decoding, but still expects an operator to be dealing with antenna and transmitter. When you're ready, you say, yes, OK, send this message. You type it and you press enter, and it does. But you're still uh, controlling the radio and just using a computer to make and decode uh, signals rather than a full sort of Wi-Fi type 
uh, computer plot. Why isn't there a full Wi-Fi type set up by now? Uh, there's, not really, there's not much reason for it. Because if you want to do that sort of stuff, you can use Wi-Fi. Uh, there's little reason to do it for satellite. Wi-Fi type operation with all the problems that satellite has is really tough. It's a bit fiddly. It's, I mean, it's possible, but it's, it's sort of getting outside what is typical for amateurs. Am I? Yeah, sorry. we are done. I mean, we have the next people. Oh, so I thought I had another 10 minutes. I apologize. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Roland, Thank you. Uh, for sharing all those information.